When we're working with selections, we've looked at a number of the different ways that we can make a selection on something. Now, what we want to do is to start working on doing non-destructive editing so that we're not actually going to erase any pixels, we're not going to kill anything, pixels that is, and instead are going to work with selections that allow us to be much more flexible and how we work with our image. We've done some of that with layer masks and things like that already. Now, it's not a bad idea when we're working. We can just leave this background layer, though we're not going to uh, do any work to it as a background and work above it because we want to extract the background from this so that we can place the model onto a new location or picture or image or texture or whatever we choose to put behind it. And while it's a background layer we're prohibited because this is the background layer, that special kind of layer that has certain properties inherently locked within it. So I can convert this or I can just make a copy of it, turn off that original background and work with it. Now I'm going to label it, again remembering we want to get in the practice of every time we add a new layer, we label what its contents are going to be so that when we're looking at our project later it's much easier to work with it and work with those layers so that we understand what's going on. We have a lot of different tools that we can use to make our selections. We've looked at them some before, rectangular, elliptical, single pixel options. There's the magnetic lasso, polygon lasso, and standard lasso tool. Those all give us rough selections. That can be a good way to work as well. We have the magic wand, which is the less intelligent version of the quick select tool. The magic wand, if I click it now, just chooses. And we can see, oh, it missed part of the background here. It is now cutting into our forehead over here. It missed the background down here. And while well, I can go back and work my selection and refine it by hand, it's nice if I have a tool that's doing it for me. But once we have a selection, and I'm going to go back and do it with the quick select in a moment, but once we have a selection, we can then turn that into a layer mask. And then that will, if I look at it, by clicking on the layer mask icon down at the bottom, add layer mask, we can click and we'll see how it added in a mask. But if my goal was to eliminate the girl, or I mean the background instead of the girl, oops. This mask, when I look at it, has properties associated with it. Now those properties are available in my properties window and if my properties window icon is not here for some reason if I go under window I can scroll down to properties and there I will see that it pulls up the properties now with that I can click right here and now it inverts that mask so that's kind of cool that I can just invert it I don't have to memorize a keystroke I can just realize it's part of the properties of that but we have some problems here. The background's been selected. It was missed over here, her forehead. So those all need to be addressed. I'm going to put in a layer of something obnoxious so we can better tell when it's not working properly. So I've put in a layer and we can see very clearly how this, the magic wand didn't work very well. The magic wand is one of those, eh, it kind of works, but we have better tools now. So we don't really want to use this. But I, I will leave this layer here as reference, uh, just adding a name into it, girl wand. I'll duplicate the background layer and then this time instead of using the magic wand we'll use the quick select tool. Now, when I use the quick select tool instead of the magic wand, it's 
a little bit smarter as it goes around and we can see immediately just based on the selection it got much closer to what I wanted. So now if I add in a mask we can see, whoops, invert, there we go, much closer. So if I had to choose one, do I want to use that one or this one? And we can see that the quick select is going to always be decidedly a better option. We also have the ability to refine the mask. And when I click on the mask, what we can do is we can now further try to define things so that it makes better selections. Now if I look at the girl not with onion skin but if I look at it on more of a black background or on white I like the black one we can see where we lost our eyelashes we have some problems with the hair there we need to do some cleanup well the nice part is we can do that and we're doing it with what ends up being like a paintbrush tool so this tool I can now make it bigger or smaller using the square bracket keys on the keyboard and now what I can do is I can paint out where I know there was some material and say hey I want you to try and clean up that edge so that we're able to start cleaning up and smart radius sometimes works where it will ah, no we don't want to do that start to find things so Photoshop 2015.5 CC is different than the 2015 CC that is depicted in the textbook or is on my instructor uh, laptop so because of that, a few of these things, then we'll be winging our way through and figuring out as we go. So it, on mine it says refine mask, now it says select and mask. We have options to repaint the mask here, we have options to re work with the selection, but the refine edge, so in the six tools in the toolbar here, the second one down which is the refine edge brush tool, if we use that what it does is it starts to look for contrast within that edge and if I carefully paint around sections where I know there was say some hair it allows me to create some of that transparency but also to start to bring back some of the wispy hair that got lost so if you notice as I paint it softens up that crisp edge and it starts to bring in a little bit of the transparency. Now I can even try and bring back around the eye. If I go too far, so if I go too far, we'll see that her eye is actually getting transparent. So if I click OK, you'll see now the green is showing through because her eye is now transparent. So that's bad, but easily fixable because I did retrieve her eyelashes, which is kind of cool. And because we got that back, now we want to do some fixing on it. So some of this got a little bit too transparent. And there are some ways that we can work with this that um, instead of doing what I just did there, there's one more option, which is under Output Settings. Because what we're able to do is we can actually output that update where I'm now trying to bring back things that are faded out onto a new layer with its own layer mask so then I don't end up making my existing image transparent so sometimes I will want to do a combination of we'll do this process twice so one I'll refine the edge and bring some hair back soften a little bit And the size brush you use is really dependent on the image and what you're working with. 
and you're just trying to really paint at the edge. This is a little bit of the art that's going on. So now I'm bringing back a bunch of the image. We can see it cleaned up the hair nicely. It brought it back, but it's a little chunky up in here. So now if I do the same process again, this time I will make sure it's going to go to a new layer under output, new layer with a layer mask. start to build it up Whoop, a little too much we lost some of her hair up here it's starting to get transparent but it at the end of the day it really doesn't matter because I can go into that layer mask and use my paintbrush like what we've done in the past and I can start to bring things back as needed to make sure it has the necessary opacity now this green background is really useful because it doesn't show up anywhere else in the image. So we can really tell that if we've put a hole in our artwork, that hole shows and we know that we have to fill it. But while I'm painting with this layer mask, I get to see that sometimes what's nice is to be able to see our mask as a layer on top of it. and that is when we enter into a mode on our computer called quick mask and if you hit Q on the keyboard no modifiers just hit Q it switches us into our quick mask mode and now this switches us out now to better see that mask if I turn this layer mask into a selection again we select the transparent pixels on a layer by holding down the command key and clicking on that layer. Now I can't, it can only show me the marching ants. It can't show me the gradations through the little selection line of, well, this is partially transparent, totally transparent, only a tiny bit transparent. We can't see that just by the marching ants. But if I switch into my quick mask, which is also in the tool palette down at the bottom, right under your foreground background color, if you click there or hit Q on the keyboard, you will see that we can now see our mask as color. Now if I invert this mask, it gives an even better idea of where it's red, that is the selection, so I've inverted it. Now with that, this is just like painting on a mask in the layer palette. You paint with black, white, and gray. Because even though you see red, you can't paint with red. Red would actually be a version of gray. You can see how the, I clicked red and it turned gray over in my color swatch. Click yellow, it'll be light gray. Click blue, it's dark gray. Go for black. So now, if I add in that, and now if I hit Q, it brings me right back out of Quick Mask, and you'll see that now that's been added to my selection. So when we're making selections, we can actually just paint the selection and we can see that selection working in our quick mask here. Now, in this particular instance, it really, I think, shows us where we can see how the hair has been separated, how the hair right at the edges, we have that little bit of transparency and that works out really well with the wispy hair look, which is what I want you to try and find an image that has some wispy hair on a background and you have to pull that person with their hair from that background and then put them into a different colored background so that we can see that you can successfully extract them. So the quick select can be a way to see what is happening with that selection, which is very different than working in quick mask where if I, or if I go here, I'm like, okay, I can see that or well, I'm on the layer mask, and I, I can't really tell. Is that transparent or not? I don't know. You can't really. You can't tell. You can't see very easily. So quick mask can be a useful way of working. Now, sometimes when we are in quick mask, and let me make a selection again, and then go into quick mask. Oh. Go make the selection, then go into my quick mask 
mode here. So when we are in this and we can see the solid color, <coughs> in our preferences, so somewhere in there you can change the quick mask options. I just can't find it at the moment. Now, periodically you will accidentally hit Q on the keyboard and then you will realize whenever you're choosing colors, so I'll go, oh, I'll choose yellow and then I try and paint with the paintbrush and it's painting light red. It's weird. I'll choose black with the paintbrush. Oh, it's painting black. I choose orange and it's painting more red. So we can see that it's transparency based on value. But I look over here and it's only showing me grayscale. So I've had students there working and they're like, it's painting red. I choose a new color. It keeps painting red. It's like, oh, well, you're in quick mass mode. And it's really easy. You just hit Q and it dumps you into it. And now we can see that that is indeed a selection. And now if I had a new layer and chose a color, and just choose blue and fill with blue, we can see how it represents exactly what that selection was. So the quick mask, where it can be really useful is if I want to paint a selection, say I wanted to paint or color her skin or turn that into a selection. So if I'm in quick mask, I can now, now I could use quick select to get it close and then I could use my um, quick mask to better refine what I've done uh, and paint it in. But this way now I've made a selection and with that selected, exit quick mask, we can see there I have a selection and we can fill it with a color our choice. And if you realize that your selection was the opposite of what you wanted, you can undo the fill, inverse your selection, Command Shift I, and then now I can fill with that color. Filling with the foreground color is Option and the Delete key. Now that fills that in. After it's been filled in, and we could overlay that onto our person. So we can use Quick Mask, we can use Quick Select, we can use all of these different tools, and the primary thing that we're trying to do is to make selections. As we're making these selections, it allows us to then work with what we have on screen. Working with non-destructive editing techniques is part of what we want you to start to embrace. So masking versus erasing, adjustment layers versus painting, because that gives you more flexibility in the long term. But there will be occasions where you will decide that just working directly on a layer is the fastest or the best <coughs> option because it gets you to your destination faster. So as much as non-destructive is great, it doesn't always have to fit into the workflow, especially in simpler things where you know that a quick destructive edit where you will not need that flexibility after makes sense. So we can use our different selection tools. We can use our layer mask. We turn things into selections by command clicking on selections once we have them. So now we can keep working with them. Next we're going to take a look at the puppet warp, which is just a bizarre feature that's built into Photoshop. So if I want to puppet warp this image, under edit I can choose puppet warp. When I do that, it gives me a mesh. And now what I can do with this mesh is I can now click 
on points, I can now add in points or pins. And these pins will be the deciding points on how the object is going to move. So I can now click and add points into my image. Now if I set over a point and hold down Option, not right on the point, right on the point we'll see how it gives me a scissors icon. But if I get outside the point, when I'm holding down Option, it gives me this circle. And that means I could move so what it's doing is it's contracting this mesh and rotating things around that point. If you'll notice, the where I click the pins, the image isn't moving. So we can see the image isn't moving where the pins are, so it's locking the lower body in. I need to, I think, add a few more pins down on the bottom to further lock that in because it was wanting to shift. So now, again, hold down Option, get nearby a point, click on a point, and now, so we could bend it forward, bend it back, and this is a very quick way to land in the Photoshop uh, Hall of Fails, <laughs> so we do have to be cautious with that because if we go too far, we can do some pretty crazy things. And once you have modified it how you want it to be, and we can see that it's modifying the image and the, ma or the mask that goes with it. Once you get it how you want, then we can click the check mark and we can now see it taking effect. So we have before, after. Now some people have done some interesting things with this where they have created basic an animations where we're able to then <laughs> save each one of these onto a new layer then we can put that onto a timeline then we can now create a short animation it doesn't animate the movement so you move a little bit and then you create a new piece of artwork for each little bit of movement and then all of those little movements played quickly creates smooth animation, but it still is never going to be as good as using a proper animation tool. The Puppet Warp is built into After Effects, which is a video animation tool, but then it will allow you to animate this over time. So I'd have the starting position of the head, the ending position, and I could decide how far apart I want it to be in time for that to occur, and then it will actually animate it all the way through that transformation. Where here we just have the before because I had that on one layer, the after because it's now on the next layer. If I duplicate it, I could then move it again, duplicate it, move it again, duplicate. It's not very convenient, but it would allow me to create a limited form of animation. Our final item for this session is going to be talking about channels. Channels are one of those things in Photoshop that now that we have layers, a lot of people don't pay attention to or don't really care about, but channels can serve a lot of different purposes. So when you are working with your image, we have individual channels that are part of your image. You will see that we have our composite, the red, green, blue, and channels is next to layers. Typically, if your UI hasn't been disturbed, channels will always be next to layers. We'll have layers, channels, and paths because we often are working with all three of these on our projects. And next session we'll be talking about paths in much greater detail because they are really important. Now we have red, green, and blue. These represent the individual color channels that are part of our image. So this is, if I were to keep the red information that is in my image. So this would be if I printed it, that's what I need. Well actually this is screen so this is the to create that bright green we can see where now we have green here no green in the skin and we look in the background under red and we can see there's no red here but we do have red in the skin so it's the concentration of those colors. 
Then we have blue, where we can see there. Now, first off on the channels, when we zoom in, what we will notice is, okay, I look on the blue and I can see those marks. Now, if I look on the green, you can see it's there. Go to red. Notice on the red, we don't have a lot of the texture. It's much smoother, we don't see blemishes in the skin. If I go to blue, we'll see that there's a lot more of the blemishes in the skin. We see a lot more variation. When you have an image you need to fix, where the picture is a little bit rough, it's a little bit grainy, usually that information is going to be in your blue color channel. And if you modify the blue color channel, we can actually start to clean up or fix our image. So in our filters where we have our different blurs and other things that we can work with, what's interesting about that is those items can then affect our image. And if we start doing the smart filters that help to try to clean up where it cleans up the soft areas but maintains edges, sander blurs and sharpen, what they're really doing is going into these individual color channels and applying algorithms that we can ourselves do manually. So if I were to take on just my blue color channel, say blur this out a little bit so it softens it be like, whoa, I've wrecked the image. And I'll say, yeah, good enough. And if I turn all my colors back on and see how it looks, you know, be a little bit more apparent when we apply this to some of the uh, whoa, other layers. helps to be on the layer we're trying to affect. Now if we go too far we start to get this dreamy effect. So, and this is one of those, when we're doing this, what's nice is to try and go, okay what happens if I go a little too far? Now let's back up a little bit. So let's back up, back up. On it. So if I'm on the blue layer, <coughs> and find my, don't want to go quite that far. So there's the softness that's occurring, but when we hit the green, within this, we're going to okay, probably a little too much on the green, but just for fun we'll hit the red channel with some blurring as well, just so we can see what happens if we do it differently. Or even. So we can manipulate the overall look and feel of an image with these color channels. Because that's where the information has been stored. And you'll notice how we start to get some separating effects where I see red showing through and green because the pixels aren't in alignment anymore. We've changed individual ones. And this is very different than when we are working on the original artwork where if I hit blur or if I hit sharpen, it, it that means it's happening to all of the layer or all the channels at the same time. 
So sometimes we can get some really cool effects or some really good improvements in our image by working with individual channels. Now, if I have, if you notice when I was in the channels, right now we see red, green, blue. We don't see anything about the layer mask. But when I was here, under channels, we can see that, oh, it looks, hey, look, there's a mask. It knows that that mask is part of it. Because what happens is that layer mask is stored as an additional channel. If I were to make a selection of something, and if I have that as a selection, if I go into my channels, I can now add in a new channel. And on this channel, it starts out as black, and put white into that. We can see how it's now storing it. We can store up to 56 channels in our image. So we have a lot of channels that we can do. And what's nice about working with the channels is if I go back to my main image, oh, got to turn that one off. If I'm back here in my main image, if I want some selection that I had in the past, I can go back into the channels. I can command click on it, it makes it a selection. But also with that channel selected, we can click down here to make it a selection. And if I have a selection, I can click and make it a layer mask. So we can add as many different extra channels. So when you've made a complex selection using Quick Mask and Refine Edge and all of these different things, and if you want to store it so it's not showing up in your layers, but you want to at least store it, you can store it inside your channels as a place to keep track of it. So it's not uncommon to have additional channels that you are storing there for safekeeping that you can go back to later. So the same way that next session we will look at adding paths. We will construct and create paths and shapes and make it a path from a selection, make a path that we've hand drawn in. And when we have that path, we can turn that path into a mask, we can turn it into a selection we have different options. We can even turn a selection back into a path so that we can keep editing it as a path. So there's a lot of different ways that we can work in this tool to get to our end result.